Hi there. In today's video, I'll discuss some helpful study resources for the technician class element to amateur radio license, as well as what to expect on the day of the exam. But before I get into that, I'll provide some background on what the test entails, what privileges are associated with the technician class license, and later on towards the end of the video, some general commentary on amateur radio culture. The purpose of the Element 2 exam is to certify the operation of an amateur station. Over the years, the FCC has restructured the license classes, and under the current structure, there are three. There's the technician class, general class, and the extra class. The technician exam is considered the entry-level license exam. With the technician license, you can broadcast on both VHF and UHF amateur bands. So what specifically can you do as a technician class license holder? The license has all privileges above 30 megahertz, and it includes a two meter band, as well as using CW or Morse code on the 80, 40, and 15 meter bands. On the 10 meter band, CW is permitted along with voice and digital modes, and you may also use up to 1500 watts peak envelope output on the VHF and higher bands. However, you are limited to 200 watts on the HF bands. Privileges on the 6 meter band are also available and meeting the eligibility requirements for this exam is pretty easy. To take the test you need the following a valid US mailing address, proof of identity, a social security number or another approved taxpayer ID number, or you can use an FCC registration number if you don't have a social security number or other taxpayer ID. Before you can get on air, you need to be licensed and know the rules to operate legally. US licenses are good for a term of 10 years before renewal, and anyone may hold one except a representative of a foreign government. The technician class license exam currently consists of a 35 question multiple choice written test. The minimum passing score is 26 questions answered correctly, which is 74%. You'll be tested on basic operating procedures, radio regulations, basic electronics, and a focus on UHF and VHF operation. When I was studying for my Element 2 exam, I discovered the Gordon West Study Guide. And I had looked at it a few others, and I settled on this one because I think it does a great job of explaining the subject matter in simple terms. This one that I'm showing you, it's an outdated copy, and it's for the question pool from 2018 to 2022. But I'll leave a link to the latest one in the description below. The Gordon West Study Guide includes the entire question pool, and when I was studying for my technician license, there were a total of 423 questions in the pool. My understanding is each question pool is updated once every four years, and as of this video, I believe the current pool for the 2022 through 2026 period is 411 questions. However, out of a given question pool, the technician class exam only consists of the 35 questions I mentioned earlier, and you'll need to correctly answer 26 of those to pass. If you don't want to purchase the Gordon West Study Guide, you can download the same question pool for free from the American Radio Relay League website, and I'll leave a link to that in the description below. Whether you purchase the Gordon West Study Guide or download the question pool from the ARRL, I would recommend checking out a website called qrz.com. This website has practice tests for amateur radio exams, and it's free to the public. The online practice tests draw from the same question pool as the Gordon West Study Guide and the ARRL. They're the same questions. One of the features I like about their online tests is you can track your progress, and once you begin to consistently achieve 85% passing on the practice tests, you should be about ready to take the exam. 
Once you're ready to sit for the exam, you can use the ARRL website to search for upcoming classes near you, and I'll leave a link to that website in the description below. The FCC has implemented a fee of $35 for all initial licenses, and that fee is in addition to the exam fee of $15, so total fees are $50. When you arrive to take the written exam, you'll need to provide something called a Federal Registration Number, or FRN, and this is a step a lot of people unfortunately miss. This number will be associated with your license, and it will enable you to manage your license information through the FCC license management system. I'll provide a link to written instructions on how to obtain an FRN in the description below. The instructions will be in the form of a blog post, but on the day of the test, you know, be on time. And again, you'll want to have that FRN with you. Bring the exact amount of cash. Don't expect the volunteer exam coordinators to be able to make change. Oftentimes they're not able to. Bring a pen to write with, blue or black. Maybe bring a couple of them. And cell phones aren't allowed to be out during the test. And only simple calculators are allowed and will likely need to be shown to and approved by proctors before being used. And you'll also want to bring a valid photo ID. These exams are offered by volunteers who work in conjunction with a volunteer exam coordinator under the direction of the FCC. Once you pass the exam, your information along with the results will be sent to the FCC. And if you didn't pass the exam, you're allowed to retake it. There is not a mandatory waiting period, so you can retest on the same day if you choose to do so. You will have to pay a separate testing fee, uh, the $15 to take the exam a second time. And for retakes of the exam, the question pool is utilized in order to create a completely new version of the exam each time you take it. So once you've passed the technician class element to exam, now what? I think your next steps depend on what your communications interests and goals are. For example, what do you intend to do? Is it purely a hobby and you want to get on air to make contacts and engage in amateur radio contests? Or maybe you're someone who's focused on using amateur radio for emergency communications. Once you start exploring the amateur radio community, you'll quickly discover there are many different camps of interest. There are people, for example, who only do two meter or HF, or perhaps most of their time is spent on DMR or Morse code, or maybe slow scan TV. Those are just a, a few of the examples. There are also people who dabble in just about everything amateur radio has to offer. I think determining one's next steps after achieving their first license class can be intimidating because there are so many areas of interest within amateur radio. I think a good place to start might be to see what local amateur radio clubs are in your area and if their website posts the weekly nets for uh, their club. And if so, take a look at what the topics are. In my area, there are weekly prepper nets, a DMR net, as well as some other niche topics. And what I'm saying is take some time to find your people. Sometimes it's a little bit easier to engage when you've found others who are interested in similar topics. After you've explored all the privileges that the technician class has to offer, at some point you might become interested in upgrading your license. Perhaps you are interested in more HF privileges, and there are Gordon West study guides for that as well. The next license level up would be the general class, and finally the extra class license, and each one has its own question pool, so the process for studying for those is the same as the technician. You would study the question pool, and once you were ready to take the exam, then you can go back to the ARRL website and search for upcoming classes in your area. The QRZ.com website also has online practice exams for the general and extra class licenses. So if you're interested in increasing your knowledge, then that's something to consider later on. I would be remiss if I didn't touch on the amateur radio culture, and I know that this can be a sensitive subject for some, but there's some high-level talking points I wanted to mention because I think they're important. One of the things I read in the Gordon West study guide was regarding something called Elmer's. 
And if you're not familiar with that term, it's a nickname used to describe a ham that can answer many of your amateur radio related questions, and in some cases might serve as a mentor. There are some hams you might encounter who could be considered Elmers and they're eager to help someone new. However, I think when a new licensee enters the amateur radio world, some have an impression that most, if not all, hams are Elmers and they are all warm and welcoming. And I can't say I blame anyone for having that impression because it is something the amateur radio community encourages when promoting the hobby. Unfortunately, that's not always reality. Although there are certain hams who will go out of their way to help you, there are others who might be dismissive of your questions and might tell you to go read the manual for the answers that you seek. The reason I'm mentioning this is once you're ready to explore the amateur radio community and mingle with the other hams, I want you to set reasonable expectations so you don't end up disappointed. I think it's important to note that many hams are hobbyists and they enjoy amateur radio for the purpose of collecting contacts and engaging in contests. For example, there's something called the Work Doll Zones. This is awarded to any licensed ham who is able to present proof of contact with all 40 CQ zones. Other hams enjoy going on fox hunts, and that's where participants use radio direction finding techniques to locate one or possibly multiple transmitters that are hidden within a specific search area. However, you may not be a hobbyist. Perhaps you're someone who's into prepping, or maybe your focus is on other aspects of amateur radio. Then chances are the camp that enjoys contesting to see how many contacts they can collect may not be your crowd. There may be a chance their interests and goals are diametrically opposed to yours. It's important to recognize that people get into amateur radio for a lot of different reasons, and I think an unfortunate situation that occurs is when people with differing interests cross paths and the conversation quickly becomes toxic and as a result someone ends up being you know called a ham fud and if you're not familiar with what a fud is the original connotation as i understand it referred to gun owners who use guns only for hunting or sport shooting, and they might oppose the ownership of semi-automatic firearms intended for personal defense. This term has been broadened as a pejorative for hams who are deemed rude, dismissive, maybe they're gear snobs, or uh, provide unsolicited opinions in, on a particular subject, or maybe they're quick to cite rules and regulations during a discussion. Conversely, there are some unscrupulous individuals who want hams to answer specific technical questions so they can engage in illegal activities. An example of that might be questions regarding encrypting comms. So if a ham suspects you have ill intentions based on the types of questions you're asking, they might become dismissive and give you a short answer of encryptions never allowed. The long answer is encrypting comms is usually not allowed, but there are a couple of exceptions. One of them is for control operators transmitting special telecommands to ham radio satellites. The other is for model aircraft using digital encryption, and that's to ensure their transmitters aren't receiving a code from another transmitter. But those are the only two real examples I've come across where encryption is legal for amateur radio use. So if that's a ham's response to that question, in that situation, I wouldn't say that they're being a FUD because no one wants to potentially risk being fined or losing their license over anything that could be construed as illegal activity. In some of these situations, I don't fault anyone for wanting to protect their license, which they put a lot of time, money, and effort into. Of course, not everyone asking about encryption is intending to violate the law. Some are just naturally curious, and that's a question I've heard many people ask over the years. This is probably a good segue into another aspect of the culture, and it's important to understand that there's a long tradition of self-policing and strictly following FCC rules. 
And that's one of the reasons when you ask a ham a question, the answer may begin with telling you what the rules are. And some may start their responses with citing certain rules because the answer may be codified somewhere and it simply may be the best answer available. So for context, when you're talking to people, don't assume you're both on the same level or like-minded just because someone else is a ham. They may have a completely different reason for using amateur radio than you do. Just do your best to read the room, and eventually you'll be able to successfully navigate the culture. Another topic is regarding equipment, and some of you may already have a radio you've been playing around with. Maybe it's a Bofeng UV5R or something comparable, and you purchased it because it was inexpensive. There's a good chance you might run into someone who disparages your radio, tell you it's junk, and you should buy a radio they recommend. I think these situations are where the culture takes a disastrous turn. Because belittling someone's equipment is a pretty good example of why some people are turned off to amateur radio. Right out of the gate, someone's criticizing you for your radio choice and telling you what you're doing wrong. My best advice here is don't spend your time on toxic people. In the amateur radio world, you'll quickly discover there are more opinions than you can shake a stick at. Some of them have reasonable points in their critiques. However, there are others who are more concerned with what brand you're rocking rather than how proficient you are with the equipment you have. Sometimes toxic people can be pretty successful at getting others to take focus off their goals. And one day you're excited to have passed the element two exam you're ready to explore the technician class privileges, and the next thing you know, you're defending what radio brand you have because it's not the right one according to someone's opinion. I believe many people overlook their own mental, physical, and spiritual well-being in favor of distractions unworthy of their time, and that's eventually what toxic people get you to do if they have their way. No matter if it's a hobby or profession, being around toxic people will just derail your plans every time. So don't get distracted by the gear other people think that you should have. Focus on how to be proficient with what you do have. In my opinion, amateur radio isn't a fashion show and shouldn't be treated as such. The price point of your radio you start out with is inconsequential. If you want a certain radio within your budget, go get one. Then learn how to manually program it, learn the menu and what those menu items mean and how to apply them. And while you're looking for your people, start listening to the traffic on your local repeaters and get a feel for the terminology. That way, when you're ready to get on air, you can do it with confidence. It can take some time, but once you do find your people, and it doesn't require a lot, just one or two, the ones you come across who are encouraging, positive, and aren't a know-it-all. Those are the ones to make friends with. Ignore all the others. Another important point to keep in mind is just how small the amateur radio community is. Out of 330 million people in the United States, approximately 765,000 hold an amateur radio license. Of that number, I would say the majority are great people who are welcoming to newcomers. I know at times it can be frustrating dealing with a difficult person in the in the moment and unfortunately not every ham is a good ambassador of amateur radio but try not to let the few who are toxic dissuade you from learning and thriving off that newfound knowledge so i would say our takeaways are monitor repeaters in your area and get a feel for the terminology continue learning no one likes a gear snob treat others as you'd want to be treated Find your people and don't forget to have fun. I hope this information was helpful and that's all for this video. Thank you for watching.